Good morning, everyone. Um, so at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Anne DeBrow Woods. Dr. Woods is the chief nurse of Walters Clore Health Learning Research and Practice, which includes healthcare journals from Lippincott, Williams, and Wilkins, practice and education books, electronic products, Lippincott Nursing Center, Lippincott Solutions, and of course, Ovid Technologies. She's also the publisher of the American Journal of Nursing and oversees the Joanna Briggs Evidence-Based Practice Products. She is responsible for setting the nursing and evidence-based strategy for our company. Anne has been a nurse for over 32 years and a nurse practitioner since 1998, and she is board certified as primary, uh, I'm sorry, she is board certified in adult primary care and adult geriatric acute care as a nurse practitioner. Anne's expertise includes implementing evidence into practice, acute care, critical care, and primary care. She continues to practice every weekend as an acute care, critical care nurse practitioner for Penn Medicine at Chester County Hospital in Pennsylvania. Anne is an adjunct faculty in the graduate program at Drexel University, and she also precepts nurse practitioner students. She speaks nationally, internationally, on clinical topics, and using the best evidence research, uh, using the best available evidence, research, and technology to improve practice, patient outcomes, and global health. Anne received her BSN from Westchester University, her MSN from LaSalle University, a post-master's certificate from Drexel University, and her Doctor of Nursing Practice degree from Texas Christian University. Anne has received numerous awards for writing, research, and publishing, and was inducted into the American Academy of Nursing as a Fellow in 2016. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Anne this morning. Thank you. So anybody here from any of my alma maters? Drexel, TCU? Go Philly. All right, go Philly. All right, all right, good, good, good. So I'm representing Drexel and Penn, okay. So today, at today's session, we're gonna talk about the importance of using evidence in practice and in research and the importance of using it where clinicians access and use information to help drive outcomes. We're also going to talk about some of the barriers to doing this and how you as librarians can really be integral in changing patient outcomes because your input is crucial to what we do each and every day. So what is evidence-based practice and why is it important? Well, we need to ask ourselves that question. No matter where I go and I talk about this topic, and I am lucky enough to travel around the world, so whether I was just in Australia for a couple of weeks in New Zealand, whether I'm in China, whether I'm here in the United States, whether I'm in South America, the single most biggest challenge that we have in healthcare is being able to provide cost-effective quality care that's going to improve patient outcomes. But here's the caveat. How we do that has to be based on evidence. Now we know when you look at the multitude of research studies that are being published each and every day, it's like a deluge. And as a clinician, I would have to sit at a computer 24 hours a day, seven days a week, reading journals. Well, that's just not reality, is it? So we need to find a way to make sure we can take all that information and make it applicable to practice, to researchers. Now what's very interesting is back in 2002, Gray did a study looking at, uh, and, he, and he worked also with the Institute of Medicine, looking at how we provide care. And what he found is only between, tw about 20% of what we do is really based on evidence. And the IOM study that was done later with him showed only 55% of the time do patients get really the best available care that's based on evidence. What's really interesting is if we did a study today, which they have done, numbers haven't changed all that much. That's not acceptable anymore. It takes 15 to 20 years to get evidence into practice. Now, if you're a patient, do you want practice that's based on evidence from 20 years ago? I don't think so. So we need to do something better to make sure we get the best available evidence into the hands of clinici clinicians when and where they need it. So when we think about evidence, we have to think about what are a country's resource. So here in the United States, we've got access to great food, natural food. We've got clean water. 
for most of our country, not in Flint, Michigan, they have issues there, but overall we have access to clean water. We have sanitation. We have electricity. What if you come from a country that you don't have these things? Your priority about using evidence and practice is going to be different based on the resources the country has available to healthcare professionals. Here in the US, we're very blessed. We have got certainly the latest medications. We have all the great research that's going on. We have great clinicians. We're really, really blessed here in this country. That is not the truth in other countries. I've been in Africa where I've been in a hospital that has 10 beds. There's no computer. Their whole idea of using point of care resources is completely different. It's something that they've printed off on a piece of paper. Okay, so it's different. But what is unique around the world is that all of us, no matter where you are, we have our healthcare systems based on the disease episodic model of care. How many of you have heard of that? Now, I'm gonna ask you guys a question. How many of you go to your doctor when you're sick? Or your nurse practitioner, okay? How many of you just go to check in? Just make sure you're doing okay. A lot fewer you raised your hands. In the United States and around the world, we base our health care based on we have interaction with our health care providers when we're sick, not for a tune-up. That has to change. What's really interesting is that in the social work literature, they came up about um, 15 years ago with this whole concept of determinants of health. How many of you have heard of that? Right? So determinants of health say you have to look at the resources within a community to really determine what to do to help improve your patient care. It's resources like, is there a high poverty level? What's the educational level? Are the kids able to get school lunches and school breakfast programs because they're starving? Is there access to health care? Does a school have a school nurse? Let me give you an example. So if I take care of a patient who just had a myocardial infarction or a heart attack and they're a smoker, and I talk to them and I said, you know, you really got to stop smoking because it's going to kill you. So I give them that education, right? They go home. They go home to a family where everyone smokes. In their extended community, everyone smokes. Do you think that patient's going to stop smoking? Absolutely not. So one of the things that we have learned recently that we have to consider these, all these determinants of health and realize the patients we're caring for is not just that patient. It's their family and it's the community. And until we change care at the community level, we're not gonna improve the overall care of our population or population health. And we need to get to this point of wellness where we stop talking about managing these disease states and we start talking about how do we prevent them. That's where we need to get. Now, how do you have a library that looks like this? How many wish you had a library that looked like this? Okay, so you know, back in the day as a healthcare provider, we used to go to the library within my hospital, within my university, and I used to use this thing called the card catalog. How many of you recognize that? Okay, remember that card catalog? All right, how many of you still have the card catalog? Anybody? Oh, there you go. Okay, good. But it was very, very different. So you had clinicians that were coming into the library, right, looking stuff up, asking you, can you help me find answers to X, Y, and Z? Now, on the floors, if I wanted to know about a procedure as a nurse, I would go up to, on my, on my ward, I would go up and I'd pull out a three-ring binder. How many of you have seen those? They're covered with dust. You've got to blow the dust off, and then you've got to open it up. And you hope that that procedure has been updated in the last year because that's a requirement. A lot of times they weren't. But that's how we access and use information. Well, things have really changed. How many of you have a smartphone? How many of you have a tablet? How many of you have a laptop? How many of you got, so you've got three devices. How many of you got four devices? Okay, anybody have five? <laughs> Okay, there's one person in the back there. All right. The way we access and use information today has completely changed. You know, in 2009 is when the smartphone came out. Think about that. Think about all the changes that have taken place. We as clinicians access and use information differently. It's all electronic now.
We're always looking you know, on our smartphones for information. We're looking on our tablets. The library is, itself has evolved. You are not four walls anymore. You are a living, breathing entity, and you are available at every, uh, on every computer station within the hospital. You're a living, breathing entity. Completely changed. One of the interesting things, as Walters Clore, is we've really looked at how um, healthcare providers access and use information. And one of the things that's come up loud and clear in our research over the past six years, the more devices someone has, the more often they use them to look up information related to their patient care. That's very unique. Ten years ago, we didn't have that. So some days, and this is like about 15 years ago, you know, we as clinicians, we had time to spend with our patients. It was nice. This is reality today. How do you work in hospitals? Okay. In hospitals today, time has become our biggest enemy. You do not have time as a healthcare professional, whether you're a physician, whether you're a nurse, a nurse practitioner, physician assistant, physical therapist. You don't have time to look up information like you used to because your day looks like this. Now, I work critical care. That's my reality every weekend. I get a day off today, which is quite nice. <laughs> but the bottom line is our whole goal here in healthcare is to provide better care to our patients to drive better outcomes. And it doesn't matter where we are in the whole universe. That's what we're trying to do as healthcare professionals. That's what researchers are trying to do. It's all about improving healthcare so our patients have a better experience, do better, have a better outcome. So let's start at the beginning. How do you recognize this lady? <laughs> Florence Nightingale. Okay, so Florence Nightingale is a nurse. Back in the 1850s, the Crimean War was taking place, and the British government was involved there, and they had a real problem because their soldiers were dying, and they weren't dying because of their wounds, okay, that they were getting on the battlefield. They were dying of infection. Their mortality rate was 90%. Think about that, from infection. So the British government asked her to go over and take a look at what was going on, and she got there, and she found that what they did is they put the soldiers in this very old building. They closed up the windows. They didn't feed them right. Didn't give them water. Didn't have any sanitation. And their dressings, they would wring them out and put them right back on. Now, how many of you would think about if you had a cut, you take your Band-Aid off, it's got blood on it. How many of you would think about slapping that Band-Aid right back on? Right? We're horrified. We would not do that today. That is what was happening back in the day. So she changed it. She used evidence. She used the principles of epidemiology, and she changed it. Within six months, they saw a dramatic decrease in the mortality rate within the soldiers. That was amazing. We, they had never seen such better outcomes. So from that time, the Cochrane collaboration, Archie Cochrane, who was an epidemiologist and a physician in the United Kingdom, he actually took a look at the way healthcare was being delivered in the UK. And what he found was there was a problem because there was a lot of people dying at that time because they got care based on the way they always did it. And, you know, that makes a lot of sense because think about it. If you're a physician or you're a nurse, you, you're being taught based on what your professor tells you to do. That professor was taught based on what their professors told them to do. So we kind of get into a rut about delivering care, not thinking we need to change things up. So what he did, he looked at the way care is being delivered, and he did a little study. And he said, OK, we're going to do care based on the way it's always been, and we're going to do care based on the way it should be done based on evidence. Guess what he found? In less than a year, he found that the majority of people who had care based on the best available evidence had better care better outcomes, and here's the most important part for the United Kingdom at the time, cost them less money. So it actually saved them money to do the right things right. Now from that time, the Cochrane Collaboration was born, and I think we're all familiar with Cochrane and the great work they do. And then from that time, McMaster University in Canada, anybody here from McMaster? <coughs> okay? Okay. Okay, heard of it, okay. So McMaster University in Canada, under the guidance of Gordon Guyot and some others really took and developed the idea of what we, we consider evidence-based practice to be today. 
And that is taking the best available external evidence, so meta-analyses, systematic reviews, those type of things, combining it with internal evidence. That is, what does a clinician bring to the bedside? Their years of experience, combined with what does the patient want? Okay, what's important to the patient? What does quality of life mean to a patient? And that has become the true definition of evidence-based healthcare. Now, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, that's cookbook medicine, that's cookbook nursing. How many of you have heard that? Right? It's not. And here's why. Because every single patient encounter, the clinician brings a different level of experience to it. You're talking about a different patient. So every encounter is going to be unique, but yet it's going to be fueled by the best available evidence. So that's not going to change. And that's what evidence-based practice is. Now, we also need to remember that evidence, we should not put it in silos. Now, we are very good in healthcare just looking at our own literature, and we forget to look and expand our view. So, you know, as a nurse myself, I was taught you look in the nursing literature. We can't do that anymore because healthcare is multidisciplinary. So when you look at evidence-based resources, they need to pull data and, and research from medicine, nursing, as well as allied health. Let me give you an example. So you fall down and you fracture your hip and you're a clinician on the floor and you need to get that patient up and walking. Are you gonna find the best research on how to ambulate a patient in the nursing literature? No. Is it in the medicine literature? No. Is it in the physical therapy literature? Yeah. Yes. So if you didn't have evidence or access to that evidence as a clinician, you wouldn't know how to best get your patient up and ambulate. So that's why as librarians, when you're thinking about making your choices of what to, resources to purchase, for all the clinicians that, that you're responsible for educating and providing resources to, you need to make sure that you provide resources across all the specialties. Because healthcare is interdisciplinary, we have to look at all the different areas of healthcare. Now, there is a myth out there with evidence based practice. And a lot of healthcare institutions say, well, I've got all the best content. You know, I've got Ovid, I've got up to date. We're an evidence based practice institution. Right? Nope. That's a myth. Just because you have the resources doesn't mean people are using it the way they should. And we really have to ask ourselves, how do you know if they're using it and they're using it to improve outcomes? So what we know is that healthcare institutions have to adapt an evidence-based practice methodology that's going to support their institutions. So what is an evidence-based practice methodology? Well, as part of my doctoral work, one of the things I had to look at was all the different evidence-based practice theories. Now, I gotta tell you, there's a lot of them out there. But one thing is sure, when you look at them all, doesn't matter what their names are, they're all basically saying the same things. And that is, if you have a healthcare provider as a clinical question, that healthcare provider needs to search and find the best available evidence is available to them, hopefully at a point of care. And if they can't find it there, then they need to be able to go into an aggregator like Ovid, like EBSCO, uh, like, uh, like uh, Scopus, to look for that information. And then once they find that information, they have to appraise it to see, is it sound science? Because not everything that is published is good sound science. Not everything that is published is going to be applicable to my patients. So they have to critically appraise it. And then from there, they got to implement it, implement it into practice. And then here's the most important part. They have to evaluate whether what they've done has really made a difference with patients. This has become extremely important. How many of you have heard this thing called value-based purchasing? How many of you say it's the bane of your existence right now in hospitals, right? Because they're looking at outcomes, and if you're not meeting those outcomes, your reimbursement level is going to be dramatically less. And God forbid you have a patient that gets readmitted within 30 days of being discharged for the same diagnosis, because you're really going to get hit with a penalty. 
It's all about evaluating whether what we've done has made a difference. This is where hospitals get tripped up. This is where you guys can really help them to make sure they're doing and delivering the best care. So is all evidence created equal? Absolutely not. I think we all know that. So when you look at the base of this pyramid, and this was put together by McMaster's, so the individual studies, so those are our RCTs, those are our um, observational studies, retrospective studies. There's a lot of those published, aren't there? However, do you ever change practice based on one study? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You never change practice based on one study. You want to change it based on a meta-analysis or a systematic review. Okay? That's your goal. And look where they hit. So a synthesis is your meta-analysis and your systematic review. Then you have a synopsis, which is like an, uh, these are like a, a Reader's Digest version of the evidence. And then you put it into a summary. And then look at the systems. So McMaster's was very keen a couple years ago. And they looked at how healthcare providers were looking things up and using it in practice. And what they realized is everybody here in the United States has switched over the electronic healthcare record. Right? That's the norm. But if you have evidence out there and it's not embedded within your workflow, do you think the healthcare providers are going to use it? Absolutely not. Because remember, time. Time is the biggest, biggest issue with healthcare providers today. So the systems is getting evidence embedded within to workflow within to the electronic healthcare record. So why do we use evidence in practice? Well, it's pretty easy. I think we all know this. It's all really about driving quality care, keeping our costs um, as low as we can. But also, it's really come today in the US and around the world to increasing reimbursement and decreasing denials. But it also does something else. It reduces geographic vari uh, variation. What that means is when I was in Auckland, New Zealand two weeks ago, and if I had my heart attack there, I would have had the same level of care as I would if I'm here in Seattle or if I'm out of my home in Philadelphia. That's what it's supposed to do. How many of you think it really does that yet? No, we got a way to go. But it will if everybody adopts evidence-based practice. The other thing that's very interesting about, about evidence-based practice is that it has been found that healthcare providers, physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, et cetera, who work in institutions where the hospitals supply them with evidence-based resources, they stay at that job because they feel the institution is investing in them. Faculty who work in academia who s will stay at a university if they feel the university is investing in the information they need to teach their students. Does that make sense? Like, it's not rocket science. It makes a lot of sense. So where do healthcare professionals access evidence-based best practice information? Well, we did a lot of work around this as a company, but I also did a lot of work as, as part of some of my doctoral work. And it's very interesting. There's basically three buckets. Point of care, point of reference, point of learning. So point of care information is information that a healthcare provider needs right then and there when they're with their patients. It's when seconds and minutes count. Guess what's happened to point of care? Five years ago, point of care meant five, 10 minutes. Guess what it is today? 30 seconds, one to two minutes. That's all healthcare providers have to look up information when they're with their patients. Why? Because time is their biggest enemy. Point of reference. Point of reference is what point of care used to be about five, 10 years ago. It's looking into some of these big aggregators, like our OVIDs, like our EBSCOs, that type of thing, where you need that information to help support what you do in your point of care work, but it's not something that's going to change the care with the patient right then and there. You have a little bit of time. So that is point of reference. It's also the place that our researchers go. That's considered, we call it point of reference, point of research. How many of you are involved with um, groups that are doing quality improvement studies? Okay, they're going to use the point of reference tools. 
And then we have point of learning. So point of learning is really twofold. In academia, it's the information we need to use to teach new clinicians. It's what our faculty are using. But it's also, in practice, what healthcare providers need to maintain their licensure and their certifications and accreditations. So it's our continuing education, or CME and CE, continuing professional development. So these are the three buckets that healthcare providers access to all the content that you're providing them. These are the three use cases. Now, as Walter's Clore, I wanted to go over some of our products that we have for you. So in point of care for nurses and allied health, we have a product called Lip and Cop Procedures. It has about 1,700 procedures in it, and it's things that nurses or allied health can look up and then immediately put in practice. For example, a patient has chest pain. They need to look up information quickly. They can go right into procedures, and they can get that information. Okay? Lip and Cot Advisor. How are you familiar with UpToDate? Okay, Lip and Cot Advisor is UpToDate for nursing. It tells nurses etiology, pathophysiology, how to treat a patient. It tells them about the diagnostic tests, the drugs, everything else that's gonna be used to care for that patient. And also it has care plans. UpToDate, UpToDate is a great product for medicine and advanced practice nurses. It tells them, how, a clinician, how to do that medical treatment for that patient. Lexicomp, how many of you are familiar with Lexicomp? It's a drug database, okay? There's also um, another one out there called Micromedics. As a healthcare provider, I need to have access to drug information, whether I'm a nurse or if I'm prescribing it, because when I prescribe a drug, which in, I can do as a nurse practitioner, I'm gonna make sure my nurses have access to the exact same information that I have who, as, the, as the prescriber. So there is no chance of a medication error. Probation we have is uh, order sets, and then facts and comparisons is uh, point of care for pharmacy. Point of reference, so I know you're all familiar with Ovid, right? So we have all our you have journals sitting there and books. And this is the same no matter what company you talk about. It's all that type of information is sitting in point of reference. So we also have MCARE and Embase. How many of you are familiar with MCARE and Embase? Embase is a, the, one of the greatest resources I have found personally related to pharmacologic therapies. Um, when I did my doctoral um, dissertation, I did it based on drug effi uh, efficacy. Embase is where I got all my information. MCARE is for nurses and allied health, okay? It is a companion piece to CINAHL, okay? It works with CINAHL. It gives you a couple more references than CINAHL has. Um, so that's a great, great product. Joanna Briggs Institute, anybody heard of that? Something like that. Something like Cochrane. Okay, those are point of, of reference. So information that you have, now you know, if your patient is doing really, really poorly, you're not gonna whip out a journal article that's six pages and read it, are you? You're not gonna do that. Okay, so point of reference is you've gotten that patient stabilized now and you have some time to look things up where you're working on quality improvement. And point of learning, whoops, is things for continuing education. So point of learning in practice, we have the um, Lippincott Professional Development Collection and Toolkit. We have um, CME as well, Nursing Center, and UpToDate also provides um, CE for physicians and nurses as well. And in education, we have a lot of products that support not only the faculty, but the student, such as vSIM, um, which is virtual simulation, uh, DocuCare. Now, I gotta tell you, when a nurse or someone graduates, they have to know how to work within an electronic healthcare record framework. It is very, very difficult. I gotta tell you, where at Penn Medicine, where I work, I am on my third EHR in six years. So, let me tell you that it has not been fun, but a new clinician has to know how to work it. That's what DocuCare does for them. Okay, let me give you some examples. All right, so you're getting a patient, think about it, you're a nurse. Okay, you're all nurses now. 
You're getting a patient in the ward who's in septic shock despite five liters of saline. They need an arterial line and a central venous line because they need to get a drug called norepinephrine to get their blood pressure up. You haven't done that. You haven't assisted a physician or nurse practitioner putting those lines in a long time. So you got to go get that information where it really quickly. Where do you go? You're going to go, have to go to a point of care reference to get that information because seconds count for that patient. Okay. You're all physicians now. You're getting that patient with septic shock. You also know that the guidelines related to septic shock changed back in February of 2016. You want to make sure that you're practicing based on the latest guidelines. You're going to have to go somewhere to get that information very quickly because seconds count with these patients. You're going to have to go to a point of care reference. All right, you're back to being nurses. They tell you that the patient may have Vibrio. How many of you heard of Vibrio? So Vibrio, now you're never gonna to wanna to eat these foods again after I tell you this. <laughs> Vibrio is a bacteria that you get from eating contaminated oysters, mussels, shellfish. I know, I'm sorry, I'm telling you this in Seattle. Um, hopefully the water is clean out here. But what happens is you go into septic shock, and what you do is you develop these big bulla, which are great huge blisters, and they become hemorrhagic. And not only are they on the outside, they're on the inside. And what do you, happens to you? You die, because you hemorrhage to death. Not a good way to go, right? Here's the caveat. By the time they figure out what happened, because they forgot to ask you, have you eaten any uncooked shellfish? They didn't ask you your travel history. By the time they figure out you got it, guess what? You're dead. Not good. That's, that's the worst outcome if anybody has any questions about that, okay? So where do you go? If you're the nurse taking care of their patient, you're hearing, oh my goodness, this patient can have Vibrio. Now, you're not going to find it in point of care literature because it's not going to be there, but it is going to be in point of reference literature. So if you go into Ovid or EBSCO, you do search, you're going to find that information. All right, point of learning and practice. So your nurses, you took care of this patient and you think, wow, next time, I need to do a better job. I need to feel more confident taking care of that patient. Well, I have 30 minutes for lunch. What could I do? You could go and sit and take a course, a continuing education course over your lunch period that's going to tell you about what to do with patient septic shock. And guess what? You get continuing education credit for it. That is point of learning and practice. Now in academia, you have students that are all over hospitals. I'm sure that you've all worked with them. Um, so the nursing student finds out they're going to go to the ICU and they're going to be getting this really sick patient. So they're going to go to a different set of resources because they really don't know anything about sepsis. So they're going to go to a point of learning resource in academia. Do you all see the difference here? Okay. So what do healthcare professionals really say they need? Well, when we ask them, and we've been doing research for years on this, what they've said is time's their biggest enemy. Right now, today, they have 30 seconds, one to two minutes to find an answer. So you gotta give me my answer quick. It's gotta be synoptic content. I cannot read a whole diatribe. Give me it in bulleted format so I can read it and get in there and take care of my patient. And it would be really good if you had illustrations and videos. And the video's gotta be short, 30 seconds. Because if it has been a long time since you had to do a 12 lead EKG and putting those chest leads on the patient, you're not going to be able to figure it out by reading something. But if you see a picture of it, we're adult learners. We learn by our senses, right? You see a picture, it's going to be cemented in your brain. Okay? And also what hospital workers are saying to us is, you know what? We need a little bit longer videos because we got all these new clinicians coming in. They're not going to learn something in 30 seconds, but if you give them a five minute video, they're going to learn it. They also at point of care want information that can be used for their competencies, their mandatories. And actually, now actually point of care resources need to have tests built in so the educators within a unit can assess whether the nurse is competent to be taking care of that patient. That is point of care. That's completely changed over the last five years. Point of reference, this is when you got more time. You got about 10 minutes or more to look something up. This is when they're going into those big databases. Now, I hate to tell you, nobody, when a patient's crashing, nobody's going into Ovid to look something up, right? Would we all agree with that? It's just not gonna happen. You're in point of care. 
But once you get that patient stabilized, you want to figure out what else to do for them. That's when you're going into these databases. So for all you AVA people back there, I'm sorry, but it's, it's the truth. Okay? And people are doing quality improvement studies. This is where they're going. Our researchers, this is what they're go where they're going. Because all their work, the resources, are going to be there to support this whole concept of improving a patient outcome. Point of learning. In practice, these are our mandatories, our competencies to show on competent, take care of that patient. Okay? You can do it at a point of learning tool, but we also have it in Walter's Core. We have it in our point of care tools as well. Uh, but this is what we need for, so that I can renew my license. I have two board certifications, plus I've got four licenses. To practice, I have to take a heck of a lot of CE credit. Okay? That's, what's really happening now is that hospitals are realizing how, how important CE is to their staff, and now they're actually purchasing it for the staff. Because they've recognized, and the research shows, the more educated you keep your staff up on the latest things that are going on in healthcare, the better outcomes you have as an organization. So hospitals now are, are purchasing continuing education um, packages or resources to give their staff. So let's look at some real life scenarios. But before we do that, I want to show, show you a short video. It's about two and a half minutes. How do nurses and clinicians access and use evidence-based best practice information? At the point of care with Lippincott Procedures and Lippincott Advisor, software within the Lippincott Solutions Suite, your staff can instantly access the latest evidence-based procedural guides and clinical decision support references at the bedside to help improve quality of care and patient outcomes. At the point of learning with Lippincott Professional Development Collection, you can validate and improve staff competency while satisfying CE requirements with a growing library of evidence-based online courses. And with Lippincott Professional Development Toolkit, designed specifically for clinical educators, you'll save time researching and building educational training materials with this reliable evidence-based and referenced set of content that you can easily teach from. At the point of reference, your staff can link from the Lippincott Solutions software to more in-depth information found in Ovid, the Joanna Briggs Institute or JBI, Lippincott journals and books, ultimately improving practice, research and quality improvement. Now let's see Lippincott Solutions in action. A patient is admitted to the medical floor with a diagnosis of heart failure with impaired left ventricular function and systolic heart failure. What exactly constitutes impaired ventricular function and systolic heart failure? Go to Lippincott Advisor at the point of care to brush up on the pathophysiology behind heart failure. And you can also find the most up-to-date heart failure guidelines and definitions in the National Guidelines section in Advisor. With the patient in pulmonary edema and respiratory distress, a BiPAP, a furosemide IV bolus, and a stat chest x-ray are ordered. What are the proper steps for applying a BiPAP mask? Review the step-by-step -step instructions for applying a BiPAP mask in Lippincott procedures at the point of care before sending your patient to the ICU. But wait, something is wrong. The patient begins to decompensate. A furosemide infusion is ordered. The nurse starts the furosemide infusion immediately. But she wonders, what is more effective for decompensation? An infusion of furosemide or a bolus? A search in Ovid and the JBI database at the point of reference will provide an evidence summary for heart failure decompensation. She finds that continuous infusion appears to achieve greater diuresis and have a better safety profile compared with intermittent bolus doses. When time allows for it, why not increase your knowledge on heart failure management by taking a course through Lippincott Professional Development at the point of learning? In the end, your patient's condition has improved and you prevented further decompensation and complications associated with heart failure because you implemented evidence-based best practice interventions from Lippincott Solutions. Standardize care, save time, streamline workflows, and improve outcomes with Lippincott Solutions. Learn more on LippincottSolutions.com. With Lippincott Solutions as the foundation, Walters Kluwer provides you with the latest evidence when and where you need it, when you have to be right. OK, 
Okay, we're going to play a little game, a little test here. I bet you didn't think you'd be having a test at 7.45 <laughs> in the morning, but this is participation. Okay, so you're the nurse, you're working on telemetry, your patient complains of chest pain, the physician orders a stat 12 lead ECG, the nurse is unsure about using where to put the chest leads. This happens all the time. Where can she go to find that information? What do we think? How many think A? B? C? D? E? And the answer is A. So go into a point of care reference, right? Lip and cup procedures is going to show her. Remember I said we're all adult learners. You show a nurse this, she's going to remember it. You write up the description of where to put chest leads in just a description, you're not going to know where to put the leads. Okay, you can't understand that information quickly. You have this, it gets cemented in your brain. Okay, physician states the patient has ST elevation in the anterior leads and is having acute coronary syndrome with anterior wall ischemia. That's a mouthful. He orders patient have a nitroglycerin infusion, aspirin, clopidogrel, and the nurse wants to make sure she hasn't missed anything for this patient. Where is she going to go? How do we say A? B. C. D. E. And the answer is B. Again, point of care, looking it up in Lip and Cod Advisor. So it's a point of care tool. Okay? And right here, she would be able to see the diagnosis and then everything she would need to know about caring for a patient with a myocardial infarction. All right, nurse knows a little extra knowledge is going to help her feel more confident in the future when dealing with these situations. So over lunch, she decides she's going to take a course. So where is she going to go? Is she going to go A, B, C, D, E? Good. So she is going to go to a point of learning tool, Lip and Cut Professional Development, where she can take a course on myocardial infarction so she feels more confident the next time she's faced with the same situation. Okay, patient admitted to the remote tele unit with COPD exacerbation. The nurse hears the physician discussing the possibility of starting the patient on an antibiotic. If the nurse wants to quickly look up the pathophysiology and treatment of COPD, where can she go? A? What do you think it's A? B? Okay. C? D? E? Okay, in this case, it's good. she's going to want to go to a point of care tool, remember, for a nurse. So in this case, she's want, going to want to go to Lip and Cod Advisor. Now, she wants to look up more information on the medical management, what that physician or nurse practitioner or PA is going to do for that patient. Then she can link right over to up to date. And one of the things that we've done, and it's not on this slide, but we have links now directly um, to Ovid and up to date on Lip and Cod Advisor and Lip and Cod Procedures because we know that people are going back and forth if they have both products. We also have in our references for both uh, Lip and Cod Procedures and Lip and Cod Advisor, if the resource is found in Ovid, it's just a quick link. We have an Ovid link solver, you go right to that, that resource in the point of reference section with Ovid. Okay, patient chest x-ray is showing infiltrates in the left and right lower lobes. Physician wants to start the patient on antibiotics. Wonders if there's been any updates on management of pneumonia and COPD. Um, so where is the physician going to go find out more information? Now, point of, this is point of care. A, how many think A, Ovid? B, C, D, E. Okay, this was a tricky one. And the answer is E, because he is going to have to go to up to date to see what the new guideline is in, on pneumonia, so it would be in up to date. But then he's going to have to switch on over to a drug database because they want, he wants to make sure that you know, the dosage and everything is correct. So he's going to flip on over to Lexicomp. Now what's interesting here for Walters Clor is that Lexicomp is the engine, the drug engine, for everything that's in up to date. So it's a, just a quick link over. So minimal clicks. Remember, time is their biggest enemy. So everything is built with minimal clicks and interoperability. Okay. Patient continues to deteriorate. He's been transferred to the ICU. He's intubated, placed on a vent. Patient continu continues to worsen, and now the critical care nurse practitioner suspects he may have ARDS. I'm sure all of you have heard of ARDS. That is not a good diagnosis to have. The critical care nurse practitioner remembers the classification of ARDS has changed, 
back in 2014. Where can the MP go to find the new arts definitions? How many think it's A? B. C. D. E. And in this case, it's going to be the, the nurse practitioner should go to the point of care tool up to date because then she can find that information on the PF ratios right away because that's how we now define ARDS. And then if she has more time, when she gets that patient stabilized, she can go into a point of reference tool like Ovid to see if there's any other information in there that was going to help her provide better care and then improve outcomes for her patient. Okay, patient been to, to tally for with heart failure, physician writes, patients poorly preserved left ventricular function. Oh, we've already done this one. So um, where can she, the nurse find more information? A, B, C, or D? What do you think? In this case, C. So the nurse can go to a point of care tool to find out this whole um, poorly preserved left ventricular function, because remember, the terminology related to heart failure, failure classification has also changed over the last few years. And so she needs to go to a point of care tool like Lippincott Advisor. And then she, if she has more time, she's going to flip on over to Ovid through Ovid Link Solver. And then I'm going to skip over this one because we did this one. And sorry, we'll get to <coughs> So here, the Pay, the, as part of a quality improvement project, the nurse educator recognizes the need to improve the knowledge of the medical floors and ICU and the management of decompensated heart failure. So where is the nurse educator going to go? Are they going to go to Lippincott Advisor? Procedures? Lippincott Professional Development? Okay, or Ovid? That's right. They're going to go to a point of learning tool and be able to assign those courses to all the staff so they can provide better care to their patient. So how do we start improving outcomes and what's your role in it? Well, first of all, we need to change culture. We need to change culture and we need to, to make sure that every hospital, every academic center's culture invites a spirit of inquiry does not expect this, accept the status quo, expects that clinicians need to explore to find the best available evidence, and then they have to innovate their care. So we have to change culture. No more doing the way, things that we've always done just because that's the way we've done it. So what we need to do is we need to garner administration support. So for all of you that work in hospital settings, it means the people in the C-suite, so the chief executive officer, the chief nursing officer, the operations officer, even the chief finance officer has to understand the importance of evidence-based practice within their organization and that it will help to improve their outcomes. But here's the caveat. You can't stop there. Because if you don't get the people who are doing the work, the staff at the bedside, whether it be a physician, a nurse, allied health person, if you don't get them on board and educated about the importance of evidence-based practice, it doesn't matter what you do, nothing's going to get done. And then here's the caveat. It's got to be embedded within their workflow. So that means any resource that you give them has to be one or two clicks away. Nothing more than that. They don't have time for it. So all everything, all the different resources you have have to be interoperable. So they can be clicked right out of the EHR to be linked directly to the information. Also, it's really, really important for you as librarians to be involved, to be up on the units. Now, in my institution, we have a clinical librarian who will come around and do rounds with us. How many of you do that here? Anybody? I have to say it's really, really helpful. We also have a pharmacist that goes with us because it makes a difference when you have a really critically ill patient and you want someone to look up that information quickly, say in Ovid or whatever um, database you're using, nobody does it better than you guys. You know how to do those quick searches and get the answers that we need to improve care. Okay. So the other thing is you guys have to be involved in quality improvement projects. Outcomes are so important to reimbursement today. Um, they constitute 25% of the amount of reimbursement you're going to get through value-based purchasing, um, and it's going to continue to grow. So it's really, really important that you are there, you are a partner to make sure they have the resources they need to improve those outcomes. 
start a unit-based journal club. Nobody knows better than you guys how to critically appraise evidence. You need to teach people how to do that because in school they're not taught that if they graduated before, you know, 10 years ago. They were not taught that. Um, so it's a new skill for them. And we also need to make sure that we don't move hot patients around a hospital. We actually move the knowledge around. And sometimes what happens is we move patients when we don't need to simply because the nurses or the staff on that unit doesn't know how to take care of that kind of patient. So we need to stop doing that. We need to start putting our patients first. So in the end, it's all about providing the best care to our patients that's based on evidence. And it's all for you guys as librarians, it is crucial that you have an equal stake in this because you are just as responsible for helping me, the clinician, provide the best available care by making sure that I have the resources I need at point of care, point of reference, and point of learning. So thank you very much.